Welcome back to our course on industrial organization. Uh, we are close to the end, as you might see from our schedule. Today we are going to discuss advertising, uh, but what you might note is that I cancelled out the part K on research and development. Actually, uh, in the previous years, this was always some thing of an advertisement for my economics of innovation uh, course I, I teach, even though I, of course, I consider this a very important topic, otherwise I wouldn't uh, give a whole course on that, uh, I think you just can look uh, up the first or the first or the first two lectures of the uh, economics of innovation course on our YouTube's channel economics to go because what I typically present here is just a condensed version of the first uh, two lectures. Okay, so today our topic is advertising. Ah, and I should say next week I'm going to uh, present you something on asymmetric information, problems of asymmetric information in particular, if uh, consumers are not well aware of the product quality. This topic is very closely related to what we discussed today in terms of advertising. Okay, so I just move on and just want to introduce you to advertising. Uh, so this chapter, what I'm doing here, is pretty much based on uh, uh, Pepper Richards Norman's textbook, Quantitative Analysis. If you want to go into further detail, look up the very interesting survey article by Kyle Beckwell in the Handbook of Industrial Organization, the third volume. Okay, what is advertising above? Uh, about? Yeah, that's what you always know because uh, everywhere you uh, turn on the TV or uh, visit some internet page, you will be uh, bombarded in a sense with, with advertisements. Uh, and what we want to inquire today is actually what the role uh, is of advertising, uh, what character it has, whether it's a good thing or a bad, whether we have too much of that or too little. And uh, advertising, in a sense, is discussed now for quite a long time in the economics profession and, of course, much more even in the, in the marketing uh, profession. And it uh, has played a central role in the development of marketing on, on how we sale, uh, sell uh, goods and so on. Uh, what is the important thing or the important contribution of advertising? So it allows manufacturers to reach consumers directly with information about their products and prices. So uh, you do not have any longer the need to uh, go via specialized sellers, some peddlers. You uh, just go around and try to present uh, your gadget to, to certain potential customers. Uh, and uh, explain them how that works. You just, if you come up with a new Samsung a smartphone or a new iPhone or whatever uh, gadget you have, you just run a, C, a series of TV ads or, or some other ads, okay? That's an important thing. And that's already gives you some indication of what advertising is about. It's at least partially about to make consumers aware of your product. And in that sense, uh, it's informative. And uh, I think there's really a reason to think that uh, modern retailing, in particular the large, large kind of supermarkets we have, uh, wouldn't hardly be possible without uh, uh, advertising. And we wouldn't have this kind of wide array of different products. And in particular, we wouldn't have so many different versions of the same products that is just different uh, brands and uh, this is pretty much due to uh, mass media and, and advertising. And we want to go into really detail. Uh, the question we want to address, of course, is whether advertising is a bad thing in a sense that it uh, makes possible market power. So it fosters market power and suppresses competition. Think of Coke, how they perhaps can, uh, can uh, keep out or keep their, their dominant position in the market for for these beverages just by advertising or a lot and outspending others, for instance, that might be a bad thing. The question is then, how does advertising work? Is it informative in the first place or is it what, what earlier uh, scholars thought, is it mostly persuasive in a sense, does it manipulate consumers? Does it uh, uh, 
convince them that they have the needs we actually do not have. So, of course, we uh, as modern economists have always problem with some assumptions where uh, preferences are not given, but we will uh, go into detail here and what this means later on. And, of course, closely to re related to this character of uh, the advertisements is whether we have too much or too little advertising. Of course, if it's persuasive and anything a bad thing, uh, uh, anyway, a bad thing, uh, we probably would think that it's too too much uh, but if it's informative it might also be too little because uh, and that will be another part we we are going into today is that firms might have an, an uh, 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 incentive to give you not too much information because the better informed consumers are the more competitive the market is in a sense okay so this is the topic uh, in a sense for today uh, what i'm going to give you next is some stylized facts about uh, advertising. So advertising is in a sense big uh, business. Uh, in the US the volume uh, was at about uh, or is at about 2% of GDP, so more than the agricultural uh, sector for instance. And uh, however that doesn't mean that each sector, each branch of, of our economy invests the same share uh, in advertising. Uh, there's a wide variety of uh, advertising behavior and you will see that particular car makers, think of General Motors or think of Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen, and uh, household product firms, uh, think of Procter & Gamble, Unilever and so on, uh, they spend the most on advertising and some directly in mass media, so you will see that in the in in in, in uh, TV uh, broadcast financed by by advertisements and also in some coupons you get some mailings and so on and uh, there is some basic pattern at least according to to Pep Richards Norman and also what what Backwell finds there is a correlation between advertising and market power so typically if you have industries with more market power you will see more advertisement. And uh, there is some consistency of advertising behavior within industries. Big advertisers remain big over time and across countries. So this is in a sense a cross-sectional uh, story. Again, uh, you might think that or might think of Coke, which is uh, for a very long time a dominant firm in a sense, making supernormal, uh, uh, supernormal profits and uh, investing a lot in, in, in advertising, okay? And what you see is that uh, it, it's the same segments or the same industries over the different uh, countries which invest a lot and uh, it's that uh, the same big advertisers stay big over time. And uh, I show you some data. These are data from for the world, uh, pretty much uh, taken from AdAge. Uh, and, but you, always, you also can get very nice data on, on advertising for Germany uh, from Statista, in particular if you're locked in with your University of Gießen account. Okay, and what you see here, Procter & Gamble is one of the largest advertiser, or is actually the largest advertiser in the world by spending $10 billion uh, uh, in terms of uh, worldwide advertising spending. In Germany, they spend more than $1 billion. That's what you would see. And uh, the interesting thing is that Procter & Gamble is, is just a conglomerate, and uh, uh, they, they have many, many different brands. I just might, uh, might show you here uh, briefly what you have here in Germany. This is just from Procter & Gamble's German website, Market in Sie Vertrauen können, uh, brands in which you can trust. So, of course, every one of you knows Pampers, everyone knows Ari and Lenore from, from New Laundry, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, it's Gillette is both for men and women, as you see, Head & Shoulders was already something I discussed with you, and you have many different things, and what you will notice is uh, it's probably no, if you watch TV, you, you will see advertisements on some of these products uh, each, each day. Okay, of course, you know Samsung, and uh, uh, in, in the next, on the next slide, I will so, show you how much different uh, uh, industries like the telecommunications or technology industry or mobile phone uh, producers uh, invest in RD. So, uh, 
Samsung also invests a lot, which wouldn't surprise uh, you. And uh, also Nestle, uh, food and beverages producer, think of Nespresso and, and uh, George Clooney invests a lot. Unilever is another company of which I also could you show. Oh, it's actually interesting that I, I really want to show you. They also have uh, many different uh, brands, as you see here on this uh, slide, and, and some of you, uh, some of these brands, and they have three pages of that, uh, might uh, be uh, like, oh, I eat ice cream, so uh, might be uh, familiar to you. So you have many different brands here as well. And Unilever is also a conglomerate. Oh, actually, that, that was uh, Unilever and L'Oreal is clear, so it lo looks like cosmetics and, uh, and so on. They also spend a lot. And what you see here is uh, alone the top largest advertisers spend almost 50 billion. The top 100 advertisers spend 267 billion or spent uh, 267 billion in, in, in uh 2016, and you will see this is really big money, and this is why uh, Google and, and Facebook are uh, or do have so high stock or market valuations. Yeah, and here you see the largest advertisers by category. You see the Daimlers, Volkswagens, BMWs, GMs, and so on, and the Teslas. They uh, invest a lot, 20, almost 20% 20 of the top 100 spending of this 267 million goes uh, or comes from the automotive sector, this personal care was what you just saw uh, also as much. Also entertainment and media, you will get a lot. Retailing is also important in Germany. You always get uh, Edeka or Rive uh, and, and Aldi and, and Lidl uh, advertisements. That's the same in our country. You see at telecoms, uh, you always can see O2 and, and, uh, and Vodafone and, and Deutsche Telekom uh, advertisements. Uh, asking you to either get a fixed line connection or broadband internet connection or some some mobile phone contract okay so uh, you see uh, here that they spend a lot however in a sense it's their share is different than what we will oh, i think i don't have even a, a number on that that the adver advertising uh, intensity in a sense or uh, the, the advertising share in terms of uh, value added uh, is rather different across industries and we will get back to that later. But you should have got an idea that this is really big business and it's important and what became more and more important in a previous year is of course digital advertising, online advertising, that is advertising on web pages and what is uh, not, or what, what you get from here is that Half of all advertising in the first half of 2018 was already a digital advertising. So more than broadcast and cable TV, uh, and uh, actually more than all other uh, categories together. And of course, it's a category which, which has or features the highest growth. So you see there was a huge change compared to 20 years ago. And... Uh, yeah, uh, I also have looked up Google's, uh, Google's ad revenue. Uh, it, it amounted to 135 billion US dollars worldwide in 2019. So really a lot. And it was uh, also for, for Facebook, it was about 17 billion. Okay, so that's uh, how they make money. And you see there's really a lot of money in it. And uh, the question is therefore rather interesting from an economist's uh, viewpoint. Uh, what is... Uh, the value, and, and in particular, why do firms invest so much in, in advertising? That's what we want to turn to right now. And the first model I want to uh, present to you, so we now start with formal approaches to analyze advertising uh, behavior. And the first model I want to present to you dates back to Dorfman Steiner's paper in, in 1956 or so. Uh, and uh, the, the point or the starting point is here, as always, if firms spend so much on advertisement and adver advertisements, it must make or it must have some sense, okay? And the point is it somehow must affect demand. And of course, it must affect it positively. So it must increase demand. And what we do here is, in a sense, just use some reduced form approach, where we just assume that a firm faces some de uh, downward sloping demand. And this downward sloping demand shifts outward 
and if if there is more advertisement so we could just draw it like here okay so here you have uh, the price here you have the quantity here you have some demand function and if you advertise it somehow shifts out okay so if you advertise it somehow shifts out actually what we are doing here is very closely to uh, related to what we did uh, when we analyzed the, the uh, monopolist's quality choice and there you saw that this, this uh, change in the demand curve might crucially or might be rather different. It might be so that uh, the people with the, the low willingness to pay or you get more people with low willingness to pay buying this product or you get more people with high willingness or you might increase their willingness to pay. We will get back to that later how really, uh, how exactly advertisements affect demand. But uh, to begin with, and I have to erase it once again, uh, to begin with, we just assume that uh, a firm, which is a monopolist here, we just look into the case in which even a monopolist wants to, uh, to uh, invest in advertisements, uh, in which a monopolist sends messages. So he just uh, makes or, or runs ads in, in, in newspapers or whatever it is, uh, or he sends uh, or she sends flyers. And the point is that uh, the demand shifts outward. That is here, the willingness to pay increases if you uh, run more advert advertisements, if you send more messages. Okay, so here you have the inverse demand function, which has always depends on, on output Q and it depends in a negative way. That is a downward sloping demand function. But the point is this, as I just uh, drew, this uh, demand curve is shifted outward, whether it rotates uh, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, that's not so important here. The point is that it increases demand, okay? Uh, and increasing in demand might mean either if we do it in terms of uh, the, in, uh, the demand curve that it uh, increases willingness to pay for a given price and so and and uh, excuse me it increases willingness to pay for a given, given quantity or uh, you can sell more units at a given price if you have uh, if you invest more in, in, in uh, advertisements okay so that's our our positive uh, sign here. If you increase the number of messages, if you increase the number of ads, uh, the demand will increase for a given price level. What is interesting and helpful here is that we define the elasticity of output uh, demand with respect to advertising. It's eta uh, A. It's just the pers if, if we uh, increase advertising the amount here, the, the, the quantity by 1%, by how many percent does uh, output or demand increase? So standard kind of demand here, it's just rearranged. Okay, so that's nothing new, it's the only point I will reserve, uh, I will uh, refer to that later on as the advertising elasticity and you know that it's the elasticity of output demand with respect to advertising. What happens to demand? by how many percentage will demand. And of course it's e increase if you increase advertising by 1%. Okay, yeah. And somehow I mixed up here the uh, animations. So, and now we can look up uh, the profit maximizing choice of both price here. We cho choose price as a decision variable and the amount of advertising. Okay, and we assume that advertising causes some co marginal advertising costs T. So T is just the cost per ad in a sense here. Okay, and it's uh, probably makes sense to assume that they are constant. And now the, the profit is just a profit per unit minus output uh, times output minus uh, the, the, what you spend on what you spend on advertising. Okay, and profit maximization with respect to the price variable leads a standard kind of output. This is here not a marginal revenue, uh, equal marginal uh, 
uh, costs because here we took the derivative with respect to the prices, but it's very similar. And what we can do is just, if you put this part here on the other side of this zero here uh, and, and di uh, divide by uh, this uh, derivative here and, and expand by P over P, you see you get, uh, or, or divide by both sides by P, you get here P minus C over P which would be this here, and you see already here dq dp divided by q over p would be nothing else than demand elasticity, and what you get here is just the learner, the learner index. That's what we did several times, and the learner index is uh, identical to the inverse elasticity uh, of demand. Okay, that's what we always have. This is nothing new here and well known to you. The more interesting thing here is what happens if we take the derivative with respect to advertisements. Again, here you really get then the marginal cost of advertisements, so put that on the other side. And here is, in a sense, the marginal revenue from additional ad. So here is important, of course, for the profitability of an additional ad. It's very important what margin you earn on each unit sold. Okay, that's, that's the important part. This is a profit per unit and then by how many units does uh, uh, an additional add increase demand. And that's what we get. And uh, if we manipulate this equation to obtain an expression containing the advertising uh, elasticity and what, which we defined above, and the advertising to sales ratio, which is rather interesting, we get this guy here. But before, let me just uh, very briefly comment on this advertising to sales ratio. In the, in the numerator, you simply have alpha times t, which is how many ads you run, and therefore uh, times the, the, the price of each, each ad, and therefore you just get your total expenditure on advertisements, on marketing in a sense here, uh, divided by your total revenue. And this is what is called the advertising to sales ratio. Okay, and you saw, remember above that, in terms of the whole economy, that was 2% for the US economy. Okay, 2% of GDP, that GDP would be total sales, total revenue, and uh, this these, uh, advertising expenditure would have been 2% of GDP. Okay, now uh, what we just want to do, and I just have to get rid of my all my curves, and it's just to, to rearrange this, this first order condition here, uh, just put T on the other side, multiply both sides with, with alpha, then you already have here something with, uh, with, uh, which is close to the, to the, to the uh, uh, advertising elasticity, then we need to divide both sides by a Q when we get this here, and then we need to uh, divide both sides by a P, and then what you see is that you get the learner index here, uh, and you get the advertising uh, elasticity here, which is equal somehow to the advertising uh, to sales ratio. I will, because this is an important result, which is actually what is called the Dorfmann-Steiner condition. This is the condition Dorfmann-Steiner uh, derived in their 1956 paper. And what, what, they, uh, what, what it says is that, or, or they just stated here, uh, namely that for a profit maximizing monopolist, interesting point here, it's a monopolist, and even though it's a monopolist, he or she feels the need to advertise, and uh, the result is that the advertising to sales uh, ratio is equal to the ratio of the elasticity of demand with respect to advertising, this is this eta A, relative to the elasticity of demand with respect to price. This is this eta P. That's our advertising. Uh, this, is, this is our condition, and this is equal to our advertising to sales ratio. Okay? And now we want to, given that we have derived it directly from the profit maximization, uh, we want to, to uh, interpret it on the next slide here. So now we can think about the relationship between advertising and market power. So first of all, what is interesting, and that's the same point I made when we discussed uh, uh, product quality, even a monopolist has an incentive to invest 
uh, in product quality, even a monopolist has an incentive to run ads. Why does uh, our monopolist have this incentive? Because ads are increasing demand. Okay, either because they inform more people, more people become aware of that, or because people who would buy the product anyway uh, get a higher willingness to pay for the product. We get back to that point why that should happen uh, a little bit later. Okay, so and now given that our monopolist invests uh, or, or spends money on advertising, we can law ask uh, what the relation is to market power because we know uh, we, we have here the learner index included in this condition. Uh, this is just here one over eta p is nothing else than the learner index. Okay, and we know of course uh, the, the, the larger is the learning index, the higher is market power. And what, so that's, we can write the advertising to sales ratio at, as eta a, the advertising uh, or the elasticity times the learner index. And what we immediately see if the learner index increases, if LE goes up, uh, advertising to sales. Oh, advertising to sales will also go up. Hopefully you, uh, it's clear, okay? Advertising to sales ratio will also go up. What does this mean? There's a positive correlation between market power and the advertising intensity. Firms which have higher market power, firms which have a higher markup in terms of the learner index, they invest more in intensity, they invest more in advertising. But uh, in, importantly here, this doesn't mean that advertising gives them the market power. The causality runs quite the other way. <clears throat> it's somehow reversed, namely that higher market power induces firms to invest more. So advertising is not the cause of market power, but higher market power leads firm to invest more. And that's actually what I uh, tried to show you here. It's very important what your margin is, price minus margin and cost, because that decisively impacts how productive, in a sense, your uh, advertisements are, okay? Higher price cost margin means uh, invest or, or advertising is much more profitable. And that's, that's what's stated here. Okay, now, so, and another point, of course, is what we also see is that industries with high responsiveness of sales to advertising, that's a high advertising elasticity, will have a high advertising intensity. That should also be clear. That's what you get from this here. If a one percentage uh, increase in advertising gives you a very high increase uh, in, in, in demand, you will invest more than if you get a lower increase in demand. Okay? That's rather straightforward. In a sense, if advertising is more productive, you will invest more in advertising and this investment is just then uh, becomes visible as a high advertising intensity, as a higher advertising to sales ratio. And what we can also say in terms of a maybe cross-sectional analysis is that uh, if you look at different industries and these different industries have, in, in, in a sense, different advertising uh, elasticities and different, and different demand elasticities, you will be able to observe similar advertising to sales ratio. And if you observe different advertising to sales ratios, yeah, this is probably due to either differences in the advert advertising uh, elasticity or in the demand elasticity. Okay, that, that's what we have. Yeah, this is pretty much uh, the first part here, uh, the very, very preliminary part, and where you get a first idea of how advertising and, in a sense, market power interact. Okay, and what, what, and, and how we could formalize advertising here in terms of our uh, simple monopoly problem and uh, derive nice and interesting and, and, and uh, hopefully intuitive results in terms of this Dorfman Steiner condition. Okay, before I move on to tell you more about uh, information and the potential information which comes with in, in, uh, with uh, advertising, I make a short break here and ask for questions in WebEx.
Our next uh, part, our next section uh, discusses the information which comes with advertisements. So the question was, first of all, we, we started up with the question whether advertising is preliminary or, or predominantly information or per whether it's predominantly information or persuasion. And that's what we are going to discuss right now. We are looking into information. How might, how does advertising provide information? And if so, what is this content of this uh, uh, advertising? So what do you, what do you, what kind of uh, information do you provide? And uh, what we want to do here in this part, <clears throat> What we want to do in this part right now is to come up with hypotheses on the level and the extent of advertising. And somehow should that depend on the type and the character of the good. So if you think of shop goods or shopping goods, uh, which are like, like consumer durables, uh, which are relatively expensive goods that are, that are infrequently purchased, like cars, televisions, computers, and so on, here you probably think that consumers invest a lot in time and information gathering by shopping around. And so the information provided in ads probably will not be so important. Whereas in terms of convenience goods, which you buy every day, like a shampoo, like laundry, a detergent, like soft drinks, here it's probably not worthwhile investing a lot of time in information gathering because these products are too in inexpensive and bought with high frequency. So here you might more or less uh, refer to uh, advertising. And I already told you our conjecture. So consumers will rely on advertising for information about convenience goods because it is free and, and spending time to gather information on such cheap goods is not worthwhile. Whereas on these uh, shopping goods, uh, we rather go uh, on information gathering on their own. Okay, that, that's what we go. And then we can also distinct, make another distinction in terms of goods. Namely, we can distinguish uh, between search goods and experience goods, and further on we will introduce a third category. We won't go into deals, uh, details which are so-called credence goods. So what are search goods? Search goods are goods where consumers know the quality, but they have to shop around, they have to walk around in order to look for the best deals. Okay, that's why you have, today have these price comparison sites. Uh, which are supposed to make life easier, but firms do a lot of so-called obfuscation in order to make it not too easy. Yeah, but it should be clear, whereas an experience good is a, is a good which you have to try in order to know whether you like it. And that is, uh, you have to try it in order to recognize the quality. Think of good books. Typically, you have to read a book uh, bef uh, until you know whether you really like it or not just by inspecting the cover doesn't give you so much information and that will be also for, for some part of food and so on. And uh, the conjecture here is that consumers will be more responsive to advertising for experience good as it provides an in inexpensive way to learn about the good. That's what you will see here because here what you will see we will discuss an, uh, a theory by Nelson which actually uh, advertising actually works or acts as, as uh, burning money. In terms of our experience good and search goods, our conjecture would be that consumers will be more responsive to advertising for experience goods as it provides an inexpensive way to learn about the good. I already told you uh, we will look into Nelson's uh, theory which, or which uh, looks at advertising as burning money. The implications here are that uh, the elasticity with respect to advertising, eta A, should be highest for uh, convenience goods. Remember, these are the goods you buy frequently. And if these convenience goods are at the same time experience goods. And it should be lowest for search goods and shopping goods. Okay, so that's what our, our uh, very preliminary theoretical thinking gives us in terms of hypothesis on what kind of of, of uh, advertising, 
behavior we should observe and what we want to do here. And, and uh, yeah, first of all, some, some, some I would call it uh, anecdotal evidence here. What you see here, cosmetics uh, is a, has a very high uh, uh, advertising to sales ratio. 10%. This is pretty much like a, a convenience good and uh, and at the same time you probably want to rely that uh, this the thing the, the the lotion you put on your on your skin isn't too bad okay uh, and uh, therefore uh, uh, you saw L'Oreal okay and and also Procter and Gamble and and Bayer so they do a lot of advertising uh, to make life easier for you as a consumer. Amusement parts is probably a sim similar category. You don't know whether they are, we are very well, but uh, you don't, don't, wouldn't spend too much uh, on, on, on uh, information gathering. And uh, uh, soft drinks are important as well. Coke, we remember. Uh, motor vehicles have a much, even though their absolute level uh, of, of advertising is rather high, as you saw, this was 10, 20% of the, of the, of the hundred large, of the expenditure of the hundred largest advertiser. Uh, it still is, uh, given that they have such high revenues, it's a rather, uh, it's uh, not a low, but uh, not too high advertising to sales uh, ratio here. Okay? So that, that's what we have here. And uh, the final point is here, uh, and that's pretty much our, our the explanation I gave to you anyway right now. Uh, we have a high percentage of sales revenue devoted to frequently bought convenience goods, okay? And for big ticket items like cars, uh, it's, it's much uh, lower and advertisement in terms of the share of sales is less important. And the question we now want to look into is how advertising could, works in term of, could work in terms of signaling. Okay, how does it work? And that's where I want to present you uh, these, these papers by Nelson. He puts up a signaling model in which there is an experience goods and we have an information asymmetry uh, in where uh, uh, producers know the true quality of a good, which is either high or low, but uh, consumers can only guess about the quality. They don't know whether uh, the, 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 the restaurants are of a high quality or of a low quality, for instance, okay? And uh, what the producer is interested in is in repeat purchases. So this restaurant wants to have you there not only once, but twice. And the point is, however, uh, you only will uh, make a repeat purchase. You only will attend this uh, restaurant a second time if the quality of the food is good. Okay. Only then you will, you will uh, <clears throat> make a, a, a repeat purchase. Okay, uh, if the producer has low quality, the consumer will not uh, come back, will buy, will uh, attend this restaurant only once, but will not come back. And uh, what advertising here does is advertising works to get the consumers to try the good, uh, but the point is that advertising is expensive. Okay, and uh, the, the basic idea or basic mechanism actually in, in Nelson's paper is that only sellers of the high quality goods can afford to advertise heavily because only they will get the repeat business. Okay, and given that this is the case, uh, you can infer from heavy advertising as consumer that this is really high quality. And I show you a very simple uh, game tree here. And uh, you will see it's a very, very simple model. Uh, first of all, nature decides on whether this good, uh, this product is of high quality, a good good, uh, or a bad product, okay, or low quality. Uh, here you see this information set that is, uh, as a consumer, you do not know whether you are here or here, that is, you do not know whether it's a high quality or a low quality, then uh, the, the firm can do decide uh, either to advertise a little or not advertising at all, or it can uh, choose a high advertising level. Now, in order to, to uh, explain you the payoffs, we have, uh, I have to tell you a few assumptions here. The first assumption here is that uh, the expected utility for the consumer, given that uh, it can be a high uh, a good with a high value, a good good or a bad good, 
uh, or have a low value, uh, we assume here that given that uh, uh, the consumer assigns some a priori uh, probability that it's, uh, it's uh, a, a, a good with a high quality, we assume that the expected value is negative. So what does this mean? If you don't get any further information, no consumer will buy this product. Okay, in that sense, uh, Nelson really triggers that firms must invest in, in advertisements. That's the, the first uh, assumption and that's what is stated in the next bullet. And now you assume that you, we have a, a high level uh, or zero level, you don't advertise, you have a little uh, level of advertisements, K1 or a high level of advertisement, and then you have the present discounted value of profits, and name, that's a profit from two sales, okay, two purchases. Uh, actually, up to two purchases, I would say, because the low quality which might sell at the same price is certainly only bought once. So with the low quality, you get only set one. With the high quality, you get set two. And our assumption is that uh, set two is higher than the set one because you attend this good, uh, the high quality restaurant twice. So they make, in a sense, twice the profit than the low quality restaurant. And now we assume that this uh, high level of advertisement uh, is, of course, below uh, set two. That is, uh, the, the high quality, if, if this producer, if this restaurant produces a high quality, uh, due to the repeat purchases, it can make profits if it advertises the high level of uh, high advertisement level. The, the other firm would make losses if it invested in this high level. Uh, it would also, however, it would make gains or might make a profit if invest in a low level K1. Now, uh, what you see here, given this assumption, we get a so-called separating equilibrium in which only the high quality firm is advertising. This is straightforward because now from the observation that uh, the firm invests uh, in, in, in a high level of, of uh, advertising like K2, uh, the consumer can infer that this is a high quality level, a uh, high quality uh, uh, firm. So now just look at this branch of our game tree. Here you see if the low quality firm were to invest in a high level of advertisements, its profit would be negative. So you can never observe that because in that case it rather doesn't uh, invest at all or uh, at least probably it would never advertise at all. That, that's what we get and probably it would uh, choose zero. And on the other hand, you see here this guy, the high quality, so here this was uh, good, so you have the high quality here. Here it's the case that uh, set two minus K2 is due to our assumption we made here uh, is positive and the firm with, with the high quality has an incentive to invest in K2. That's what we see. Uh, and if, so the point is here, uh, if the consumer observe uh, the low or level of advertising or no advertising at all, it doesn't get inf any information and here it kicks in that the expected utility from consumption is negative, the consumer will not make a purchase and will not attend this restaurant. Whereas if it observes a high level of, of, of uh, advertising, it can be sure that this must be must be a high quality product uh, and therefore because otherwise uh, the, the, you, you wouldn't experience that you have the high quality and you wouldn't make the repeat purchases and therefore you know that it's a high quality. Okay, that, that's our important point here. And so what, what is the, the, the message from, from uh, Nelson's model? So here, what information content must this advertisement have? There is no information content at all, okay? The fact that you advertise at all, at all is itself the message. And high advertising say, signals high quality. That's why it's, it's, it's called the burning money theory of advertisement, okay? Because you have to spend a lot of advertising in order to signal uh, that it's a high quality because a low quality producer could never break even given this high level of advertisements and given the fact that uh, you have a low quality and you uh, uh, wouldn't have see repeat purchases.
Okay, the problem, of course, there are many problems with this model here. One is that uh, it assumes that the profit margin from selling the high quality more than once exceeds the margin from selling the low quality ones. So it really depends on the ratio of price and of marginal cost. Of course, uh, you can always uh, make assumptions that you don't get this kind of separating equilibrium. Okay. Uh, if the profit from a low-quality sale is really big, low-quality firms will have the incentive to advertise. But that, of course, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would uh, contradict our assumptions here. And uh, what is rather interesting, given that this advertising expenditure signals quality, you always should see that uh, in each uh, advertisement, adver advertis Advertisement, you see, uh, you also see the, uh, this uh, 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 note stating this uh, advertisement or this ad costs uh, 10,000 euro. Okay, you should announce your adver uh, advert, ad too complicated word, your advertising costs. Okay, and uh, what what is a f minor point in my view is that this model applies to all experience good, uh, but much more intense advertising can be seen for consumer experience good rather than B two B experience goods. Uh, there has been a or. Uh, uh, Large literature on that. Uh, Paul Milgram, who received, I think, the Nobel Prize for his other work, uh, in particular on auction theory, uh, in last year, uh, together with, uh, I think it's John Roberts, uh, suggests that price, together with advertising, uh, can signal quality. So here uh, you somehow get the old uh, idea that a high price can signal a high quality and the low price uh, suggests a low quality. And here uh, what, what they do is they show under what circumstances a high price alone is not enough to signal a high quality and therefore you under this they show the circumstances uh, under which you also need to complement this high price with a high advertising spending. Uh, there's another paper by Thut and Garella uh, who look into this situation when there is competition among two or more firms. Okay, and there you can also have a similar uh, combination of high price and high advertising, which can signal high quality. So the Milgram Roberts, as well as the Nielsen paper is actually a monopoly paper or a single uh, firm paper where you just don't know whether the quality of this product is high or low. Uh, and this will remind you very much of economics of regulation, where we uh, very often dealt with this kind of, of uh, Questions. A fluid garella is one where we have competition. So, how, what does the empirical evidence say? There are some papers which are stated here. They find little relation between advertising and quality. So, they cannot confirm that higher, uh, that if you observe a firm investing more in ad advertisements, it also has a higher quality. And uh, at the same time, there's little indication that a high price signals a high quality. Uh, the problem is always, how do you measure quality? Quality is in the eye of the beholder, in the eye of the consumer. Uh, perhaps you just think this is a higher quality or you feel better if you buy a product which is heavily advertised. Uh, and therefore, you everyone knows that product and you can talk about it. Okay. So it's not so clear what, what contribution or what, what uh, this really, uh, what, what uh, quality really means. Uh, what, what here we have another anecdotal evidence here provided by uh, Pepper Richards Norman, the price and the quality in, the, in a vacuum cleaner market in the US. Here you see uh, from some uh, tests, like in Germany we have the Stiftung Bahn test, some consumer protection agency or association who does product tests and they then come up with some quality level. In Germany, it's sehr gut and so on. It's just uh, the grades you get at school. And here you see the different grades these uh, products got. And you see uh, the, the grades are pretty much uh, uncorrelated uh, with, with the prices. Here you see a price of this Kirby of, of more than $1,300 uh, and, and uh, you see here, this has an average level of quality. However, again, the question is, what is quality? Okay, and is what, for instance, the Stiftung Bahn test in Germany, this German uh, uh, 
consumer protection or, or yeah, agency uh, does, is that really a pro do they really come up with objective product quality measures? Yeah, we just learned that uh, the important thing about advertising uh, or the important information about advertising might be that you advertise it all, that is that you burn money. Uh, of course, this is no, not the only way in which uh, information comes uh, up in, in, in advertising. Uh, so this evidence on signaling is mixed anyway, and there is no correlation between advertising and product quality. And the question is here, and that's what I already told you, uh, that this informational role of advertising is somewhat uh, ambiguous. And uh, you might always come up with uh, or some consumer protection agencies or advocates might come up with the idea, oh, we ban every information which is not uh, not, not uh, informative. Okay, So you have to provide a lot of information. And uh, the quest or the point is what, what you observed is that a lot of information, or a lot of advertising apparently doesn't ha does have little informational content. Okay? And so it often does not mention the price of a product or the quality, but it just gives you some general feature of the product or just the product image. So from the reason, so recently Samsung, uh, Samsung, uh, Uh, presented or run ads on this new, I think it's the Galaxy 21 or whatever, however it's called, and uh, it's rather limited information you get. And here the, uh, I want to uh, discuss with you or present to you a very nice paper by, by Simon Anderson and Regis uh, uh, Renault, uh, where you see that it might even be a good thing that firms uh, advertise but suppress some informational content of that advertising. So in a sense, they don't uh, show you the full picture. So uh, that this paper, I think it's American, published in American Economic Review, uh, and it shows that it's a good thing, even from a viewpoint of society, that firms suppress some advertising content. Just imagine you have three types of consumers, and each... Uh, with a different willingness to pay for each of uh, three different widgets. So call these widgets a smartphone. Uh, you have a consumer, one who would value highly, say, if it has a very uh, good camera, consumer uh, uh, only lower if it has, I don't know, very good sound equipment, and the third if it has a very powerful, uh, uh, what you would call it, uh, processor so that the, uh, uh, the games work rather well. Okay, uh, and uh, so you have consumer one who pays a lot for this red uh, uh, characteristic or is very much uh, folk interested in that. Uh, consumer two is more interested in this yellow, which would be the sound or something like, and consumer three would be more interested in the blue dimension of the widget. Okay, and the point is, however, uh, that uh, it, the, the firm can only produce a certain widget. It's either red, yellow, or blue, okay? And, and we assume uh, that it's just one of these types. And uh, hopefully this is clear. There are some further uh, assumptions on that. Uh, so, of course, in order to buy that product, and this is just a simplifying assumption, so you have some inconvenience costs. We call these transport costs. And... Uh, and uh, 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 Simon Anderson and Regis Reno uh, assume that it's $5.1 cent, $5 cent in visiting the store and the consumer expect that the store has each type of widget with probability one-third. So if there is no further information, you think it's equally likely that uh, the, the widget which is on offer at this whatever store uh, is, is red, uh, yellow, or what was the third? Was it blue? I think it was blue. Uh, and uh, now consider the store has only red widgets. If it advertises that it has red widgets, consumer types two and three will not visit the store. Why? Because if they are there at the store, a consumer two, we probably should go back, a consumer two has a willingness to pay of 50. 
And of course, if he's there, he already uh, or she has already encountered this transport cost, so she would be willing to pay 50. Uh, and and uh, uh, consumer fee would be willing to pay 20. But now remember, we had this assumption of, of uh, uh, transport cost of $5.01. So uh, it would actually be at a price of 15. The price inclusive, the transport cost would be $20.01. So it would be higher than the willingness to pay. Knowing that, okay, knowing that, uh, these consumers will not visit the store. Should be clear right now, because if they are there, uh, con, uh, con, uh, uh, the, the, the store owner knows it. But given this uh, kind of thinking, uh, the, the store owner must know that these types will not visit the store. So once a consumer shows up in a store, it will be consumer one. If it's consumer one, and you know it will be consumer one, then we just can jump back. Consumer one has a willingness to pay a 40. So if, he sh if some consumer shows up, the firm will charge or the store will charge 40. And of course, that's a bad idea because uh, the total cost would be 40 plus, uh, plus the transport cost five here. Okay, so it would be 45. The consumer one will not respond to a red widget advertisement either. Okay, that is, uh, if it adv advertises when it has a red widget, it will not sell a widget. However, if it advertises simply that it has widgets, so these new grand smartphones, okay, uh, and all consumer types will now visit the store. Why? Now yeah, they know now or they uh, assign a pro uh, probability. Uh, of each particular type as one third, and given that they are willing to pay 40 for, for the one, 20 for the, the other, and the 15 for the third, uh, it gives a total of 75, and one third of that, uh, uh, each with probability one, one third, so the expected value will be 25. Okay? But however, now the, 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 the store does not know who will who is who is who if all three consumers are there and therefore given we assume that if they are there they know now can observe uh, what kind of, of uh, product it is uh, the store owner can only charge 15 because three times 15 given we assume marginal cost of zero further assumption here uh, uh, three times 15 is 45 which is more than if you sell one unit as four, then, uh, at a price of 40 or two units at a price of 20 each, okay? So you get a maximum revenue of uh, 45 and you will sell uh, to everyone a red widget, okay? So consumers are standard above pricing in, in that watch and given uh, that uh, the expectation is that they by a price of 25, uh, they will attend the store and everyone will, because it's, it's higher than, than uh, these, these $20 uh, and one, one cent. And uh, they understand that the price will be 15, okay? And then we will just buy. And the point is here, if the store suppresses information, Everyone will buy, okay? And so it's a good thing, even though from a, from a, from a, from a, a total surplus, from a welfare perspective, if you had a law that you uh, had to have to fully disclose all the features of the product you sell, this might lead to a breakdown in the market, okay? That's an important point. I think that that's why this is a nice story. That's why we got this paper published in American Economic Review. Okay, that, that's uh, what we have here. So the, the interesting uh, point here was really that uh, it might be a good thing if you don't reveal all information about a product. Yeah, advertising now, uh, moving on here. Advertising, of course, is, oh, Pep Richards Norman put that lava, oh, in, in, uh, I don't know, Kriegerisch, so in, in 
what, whatever Kriegerisch is in English, uh, it now escaped me. So it's like a weapon. Advertising is like a weapon in the competition between firms. And so uh, a brand identity might be important. And uh, it, brand identity might also be helpful to consumers. And uh, therefore, it might be a good thing to create and, and secure a brand identity. So consumers may have a taste for variety. So, and each consumer may like a different version of a product. So given, uh, think of just of these different German beers, uh, they, they always try to convey different images and the one likes the one image more and the other one like Jevel, uh, Pilsner has this image of these hard guys uh, going to the sea and so on, whereas I don't know, Kronbach is more relaxed for him. And uh, what is also clear, of course, it should have been clear right now, is that advertising can match consumer with the version they most prefer if it's largely informative. But the important point is that, uh, again, if you think of, of the beer advertisements, advertisements can also be uninformative and a wasteful form of competition. And that's what we are going to uh, look into uh, in in. in this next section, where we uh, uh, where I show you a very uh, simple payoff matrix in a very uh, standard prisoner's dilemma game. So uh, we can evaluate uh, the competitive role of advertising here. We need to know for that how advertisements work. And here we have a very simple model of advertisements uh, in which uh, firms can either spend a little or a lot and if one firm outspans the other, uh, it, it just uh, cancels or uh, it just attracts more uh, uh, demand. And if they both uh, spend the same, advertising just uh, cancels out each other. Okay. And what you can get here is what what uh, Pepper Richards Norman call an advertising war in which firms spend excessively on advertising. It's much easier if you look into this payoff uh, matrix. Just call these two firms, not Gamma and Zip, but call them Kronbacher and Bitburger and just think they, they, uh, they advertise uh, before, uh, uh, before the Sportschau, before soccer games and, and before the, the, the crime story and so on, before the thought what. And the, the point is here, uh, if uh, Gamma invests only a little in advertisement. Uh, actually, call it Kronbacher, okay? It's easier for me and call this Bitburger or Warsteiner, probably given we are in Gießen here and Licher is part of uh, Bitburger, we should uh, go with Bitburger here. Uh, so if uh, Bitburger expects Kronbacher to only advertise a little, it would get 450 is also advertises a little, but it would get more because it just attracts consumer from Kronbacher. Uh, so it has an incentive to uh, invest in high advertising spending. The same holds if uh, Kronbacher invests a lot, because if it only invests a little, it gets, it loses many consumers. So it has an incentive to invest uh, in, in high advertising uh, expenditure. And that means uh, investing a lot in advertisements is a dominant strategy. And we get this here as an equilibrium. Okay. And, but this is a typical prisoner's dilemma. As you see, uh, if the, 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 the equilibrium is both uh, advertise a lot, but, but however, here we have an, a wasteful advertising board, but because it just cancels out each other and apart from uh, the, 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 the actors who are featured in these advertisements, uh, it's just a loss in terms of, of, of resources because uh, their joint profits would be much higher uh, if, if uh, they invest in, in only a little in, in advertisements. Okay, that, that's what we have here. And so here uh, you once again see that the Nash equilibrium is for both firms. Uh, to choose a high level of advertising expenditure. And this does not maximize the joint profit. It probably is also bad for consumers. So we get 
excessive advertising that largely cancels itself out with little gain to consumers and lower profit for firms. Okay? <coughs> yeah. Still, uh, information is the, the topic which haunts us once we discuss advertising. We still uh, need to invest even more in terms of what this information means uh, and, and how it works to understand really uh, the incentives of firms to advertise and to provide information here. And here we look into actually our hoteling model and you will uh, learn about the very nice model by, by Grossman and oh, I think it's Grossman Shapiro. Is it Shapiro? Yes. Uh, which we want to look into and they used a variant of the hoteling model of which you are well aware right now. Suppose we have end consumers distributed uniformly along a line and so the density here is N. We have two firms, firm X and, and firm Y located at the ends of these markets and what you know or what we assume that each, each uh, consumer is willing to pay uh, this reservation price V for this basic product. But of course, what we also assume that we have some travel costs T per unit of distance and we get the equilibrium prices with the entire market being served of P is, plus, plus, is just C plus these absolute uh, uh, markup determined by the transport costs T. Okay, so that's uh, what we uh, derived above. And now we want to look into how we can or how, how actually Grossman Shapiro modeled here advertisements and the informational content of advertisements. So what, what Grossman and Shapiro assumed is that each firm can choose to advertise. And the point is here, advertising here is really informative. It informs the consumers about the existence of the shop. Okay, if you don't advertise that you have a new Döner uh, stand somewhere, they just don't know and they would not go there. Okay, uh, and uh, so what they assume is that the firms can choose theta x and theta y, which is the share of consumers which is informed. This is very simple because uh, suppose you just distribute flyers and the more often your flyers distribute, uh, the more likely is that a higher share of the population is informed. Okay? Now, uh, suppose that this fraction is determined independently, then from the perspective of firm X, if it invests theta X, suppose uh, it invests so much that half of the population uh, is informed, uh, it, it has two possibilities. Uh, suppose also that uh, firm Y also uh, invests theta Y equal uh, to one half, then it's clear that of these one half uh, people who receive, or, or from the, the one half people I receive, uh, one half will have got uh, the, the, the ad by uh, firm Y and the other half not. So, theta x times 1 minus theta y. So these are the consumers you, which are not informed. Uh, so these are the consumers who know only product s. And the fraction of theta x times theta y will know of both x and y. I try to somehow show you that here. Uh, and I think I should wait right now. So our total uh, number of consumers is, uh, is distributed in several different segments here. This, seg is, this is a monopoly segment, this blue here of firm X. This would be just the theta X times one minus theta Y. Then firm Y has also monopoly uh, segment, which would be theta Y times one minus uh, theta X. Then there is an uninformed segment, which would be just one minus uh, theta X times one minus theta y, okay, and then there is this competitive segment which would be just uh, this theta x times uh, theta y, okay. Now here you see we immediately get demand functions. 
uh, determined here by, by the adver advertising uh, expenditure. Okay, and so that's what I already told you. Firm X is a monopoly with respect to the uniform but less dense population of theta x times 1 minus uh, theta y times n. Uh, they know only the x, okay? And uh, firm x competes with firm y for the also less dense but uniform population of theta x times theta y, who know both goods. And now assume that the equilibrium price px is low enough that all consumers in monopoly segment buy one unit, in a monopoly segment buy one unit of X. What does this mean? We want, uh, so here's this guy located at one who does not know about the existence of shop Y, okay? But uh, who knows about the existence of shop X and we assume and uh, that you, we could draw some, some transport costs here and we assume that the transport cost inclusive the price for this guy located at one here are lower than his or her uh, uh, reservation price. That's a standard uh, assumption in order to make the problem interesting. And, uh, and uh, we ch always can generate that by assuming that, that the reservation price V is sufficiently high. Now what we get here is QX, a demand function for firm X. Here you see the monopoly part. Uh, it does not depend on a price as long as the price is sufficiently low, that is as long as, as V, the, billing, uh, the reservation uh, price is sufficiently high. And here uh, you get here the share of the, uh, the, the, the share of the, of the competitive segment here, theta X times theta Y times N. And here, this is the standard, uh, standard demand function for, for the hoteling model, okay? Now, we have this here, firm Y, of course, has a similar demand function, and each firm now has two decisions to make. Uh, first of all, we would say the pricing decision, and second, the advertising decisions, that is, how big theta, the share of uh, the population you want to inform is actually, okay? And now this is straightforward. Once we just assume that uh, 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 advertising expense uh, just is a function of theta here. We want to have the, the, this, that we get an interior solution. That is that uh, firms do not want to inform everyone. That's why we want to make it convex here. Uh, some alpha, some uh, in a sense productivity or cost parameter, which makes, uh, makes this expensive. So uh, we just, determine or it can determine the theta, the share we want to have and uh, uh, advertising expense increases more than proportionally with this share here, okay? Apart from that, you will see that this uh, divided by two just uh, gives a nice linear form here and gets rid of the two. Again, uh, the square gives uh, in, in, that the function is squared in, in theta gives a nice linear uh, form. Okay, now uh, oh, what I should have done here, and I think I do that on the next slide, hopefully, uh, is what, what we just get is that the marginal cost of advertising or simply this alpha times theta times n. Okay, the more, the more uh, consumers you have, the higher the cost from advertising. And of course, this alpha is then some cost parameter. And now, uh, what, what we get here, and I think I didn't even do it because it's so straightforward and it's uh, pretty much or, or very similar to what we had up there when we, it's almost the same thing uh, as above here uh, in, when we derived the, the, the Dorfmann-Steiner condition, so no need to, to, to reproduce it here. Uh, the point is, and you really should check this here, the price we get here if we take the derivative with respect to the price, we get price is equal to C plus square root two over, a, uh, over alpha T. And uh, our share is two over one plus two alpha uh, over T, okay? Now, the, the point here, uh, or uh, first of all, this guy here, oh, I can read here. Uh, note that alpha must be greater so that uh, uh, 
greater than t over 2, uh, only then we get an interior solution and uh, firms decide not to inform everyone. So uh, advertising must be uh, sufficiently costly so that you don't get everyone or, or that uh, everyone is informed. And this is not only the interesting. So it must be a bit expensive. And uh, so we get some info, uh, consumers uninformed. And now what this, however, means is that uh, the equilibrium price is now higher, given this, this benchmark. Uh, given that we want to have that alpha is larger than t over 2, this expression here is larger than t, and therefore, therefore uh, the price in the imperfectly informed case is higher than uh, in the fully informed case, okay? Uh, must be in a sense because information is costly. Th that's not so much of a surprise. And therefore it has to be provided uh, through ad advertisements and this is reflected in the product price, okay? Uh, what is also interesting here is uh, that of course or, or what, what we can see here is that advertising increases as t increases. So here you see uh, theta, if t increases, this is in a denominator of the denominator, so this part becomes smaller, the whole expression becomes larger, and therefore uh, you invest more if you have more loyal consumers. Uh, if your consumers are uh, loyal anyway, you want them to be informed. Okay, that, that's an important point. If your products are differentiated anyway, uh, you want to inform that. And uh, so you get a, a positive relation, a positive correlation between advertisement and product differentiation, not because advertising uh, causes product differentiation, it does quite the opposite, but because specialized consumer taste, because loyal consumers lead you uh, that you want to inform everyone. Okay. Uh, on, the op uh, on the opposite here, uh, in terms of uh, advertising does not cause uh, product differentiation, as you will see from the next uh, part, uh, what you see is that profits rise as advertising becomes more costly as alpha rises. In order to see it, you just have to, to look at the, the profit function. Actually, probably in order to see that, you would also have to to, to uh, take the derivative with respect to alpha, which you probably should do. Uh, and uh, the, the point is here, given that uh, advertising becomes more costly, you see that here you also have advertising uh, being a prisoner's dilemma. Okay, why? Because as alpha rises, firms do less advertising and fewer consumers know about about both products and you soften price competition and therefore you get higher profits. But of course you're always tempted. Uh, you're always tempted and you do not take into account that you, if you advertise more, you increase competition. Okay. Of course you don't want too much because you, it makes competition too tough, but you, in, in, compared to, to uh, joint profit maximization, you overinvest uh, in, in, in advertisements. Okay, so I think this is, uh, I, this is one of the, of the papers I like most because it really makes clear uh, the informational content of advertising. Here's what you get is you uh, send out more flyers, uh, you, you run more newspaper ads, more people are informed about your, your, your product. Uh, that's a good thing because you get more consumers compared to the situation. And I think I just should go back to my uh, nice diagram here. You get more consumers, but the point is at the same time, and that's a bad thing about advertisement, it, uh, intense, uh, it increases the intensity of competition, okay? Because the competitive segment increases, the, the monopoly segments decrease if you inform more consumers. Yeah, that, that was the point I, I wanted to make here. So very nice paper, this Grossman Shapiro paper, and you'll see again uh, for which different purposes you can use the hoteling model.
Uh, now, we go back to a paper published in the quarterly, quarterly journal uh, in, in 1993 here, uh, where Becker and Murphy uh, look uh, at other avenues how advertising works. Uh, we look into the case, in, or what they uh, claim to do is that they look into advertising as a complement to the product. So in the grossman Shapiro model, advertising is poor information. And Berker Murphy also allow for this point here. Uh, somehow uh, what they say here is that advertising provides information that enhances product value. So for instance here, the, the example is that you get information about related services. So if you have a hotel and they uh, advertise on their website that you that there is a nice gorge uh, you can attend, uh, we can some, do some hiking, this increases your willingness to pay for this product. Okay, Here advertising would be truly informative and uh, therefore brings uh, in new consumers and ex it extends the brands or in that case the hotel's market reach. So it uh, makes more consumer aware of the product and here uh, it's not the product uh, of which the, the, the people are informed but of some complementary services in, in a sense. On the other hand, uh, uh, it could also be more like uh, the persuasive view of advertising, that is you convince them. I, I still do not exactly know what the difference between persuasion and manipulation is, uh, but, but here in a sense you convince them this is a good thing, perhaps even uh, contrary to their own convictions. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and yeah, that's what we have here. Uh, consumers prefer to purchase brands that are well known. Advertising builds brand value in that uh, respect. I think uh, uh, in, in Beckwell, in his survey article, writes that consumers may value social prestige. So you know, oh, this is a Rolex and this is a very high or, or an only, only uh, Shaw Connery uh, and, and important uh, politicians. So I think uh, President Biden also uh, wears a Rolex, but I guess... He isn't paid for that, but at least Sean Connery was paid for that. And uh, so here it would be about the, 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 the brand value you build. Uh, probably it's, it's easier if we just look into the diagram, what we mean here by brand value versus uh, extending reaches, pretty much related to what we discussed in terms of how product quality affects uh, 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 willingness to pay and demand curves. So if that's the original demand curve, the D1 here, uh, this uh, building value means just that the willingness to pay of existing consumers increases. Okay, This is like an increase in product quality. When advertising builds brand value, it rotates the demand curve up along the price axis here from, from this point. And uh, it, what we previously saw in this case, at least if marginal costs are zero, uh, the monopolist uh, would not change quantity, but would just increase price. So if you convince the guys uh, by, uh, by means of, of advertisements that this Rolex is really great, they just will have a higher willingness to pay. Uh, the second case is this extending reach. This is very much like in the case where uh, the... Uh, the, the willingness to pay off the marginal consumer increase more than here it's the inframarginal consumer whose willingness to pay increase more here it's the marginal consumer and you just see we now get just more consumers of the same type it's just like if you add a second uh, consumer group with the same type uh, distribution and what you see here uh, the elasticity wouldn't change and we get the same price but just sell more Okay, that's what we get here. Uh, advertising extends the brand market reach. Uh, and uh, here, of course, it's always the question in both cases, what is really happening here? And uh, both cases uh, have been uh, distributed a lot because even though Beck and Murphy don't consider this case as one of persuasion, but rather than like this addition, this complementarity and this additional 
uh, prestige coming along with, with advertisements. Uh, in, in, in earlier times, it was a big discussion whether if we have, if we interpret this as persuasion, we just persuade these consumers that this is really a much better product than they always thought, their willingness to pay increases. But the question, is this a true increase in willingness to pay? So to say in quotation marks. And then uh, we have a lot of trouble in terms of our welfare analysis, but because if it's not a true increase here, uh, uh, we actually don't get, if the price is higher, we don't get any longer this kind of consumer surplus, but actually the consumer surplus would be something like that, and we really would overpay. They, they are forced to pay more uh, than, than they actually uh, are willing to, and uh, you, you see immediately that uh, mainstream economists run into trouble with this, uh, or because then we have problem with consumer sovereignty and so on. So uh, that's probably why Becker and Murphy came up with, uh, with this kind of, of presentation. Yeah. So what we will do is, if uh, we, we think if consumers are willing to pay more, this is really actual willingness to pay. Yeah, and uh, so uh, the evaluation of uh, advertising efforts from a social welfare or efficiency point of view really requires that we understand whether advertising is predominantly value increasing or extends market uh, 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 reach because here you see you have rather different effects. Uh, here it's a different consumer groups we you add uh, in, in terms of informative advertising. Here it's clear you don't have any, any pr trouble with, uh, with welfare uh, issues or with, with welfare measurement, whereas here you might get some problems. At least that's what I tried to explain to you. Uh, if we add competition, we run into to more trouble because then we again can have the fact that uh, advertising works by stealing consumers and we get this kind of excessive uh, information. Uh, the, the problem is here uh, we get this wasteful advertising game we just had. Uh, that's more or less if, if it's about information because if almost everyone is informed or if you inform serve more people and this doesn't uh, lead to a change in prices, you just have business stealing. Okay? You just if one in for if 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 you you have your consumers which uh, attend uh, or come to your store and the other and you charge the pr same price as the other guy anyway uh, and if uh, the other guy just uh, informs more of your consumers and they move there, uh, it's just uh, a redistribution. Uh, and therefore a waste of, of resources. Yeah, if it builds value, if it increases willingness to pay, excessive advertising is less likely uh, because here it just works uh, to permit uh, or works to charge existing consumers a higher price, not by taking consumers from the rivals. But again, uh, that's again what consumer advocates would not like that you charge them a higher price, even if you tell them as a company that uh, they really learn about the true properties of the product and they just increase uh, or the, the, this just increases the willingness to pay. And oh, I think um, um, this is the last part I want to, to tell you. Uh, building value versus extending reach. Uh, here the amount of advertising uh, is really depending critically on the nature of price competition and uh, the number of firms. Uh, and rather generally, of course, uh, if price competition is fierce, firms may advertise a lot to differentiate their product and soft price competition. So this is, again, different than from the Grossman Shapiro world, but rather that you convince them that this Volkswagen is really a completely different car than any other car uh, when, when the number of firms is small. Uh, firms may gain from advertising because most of the gains of a firm's advertising flow to that firm itself and not to its rivals. Think just in terms of smartphones. Uh, you advertise your new, uh, very new uh, properties of your new smartphone as, as Samsung, but actually then I don't know who away or some no-name Chinese uh, producer comes up uh, 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 
having the same kind of properties but not advertising, uh, then of course some consumers might just switch to them. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the problem is really that advertising to a certain degree might also uh, increase uh, barriers to entry as advertising is largely a sunk cost. So uh, by softening price competition, uh, you may limit the equilibrium number of firms because you have to invest so much in, in advertising. Okay, uh, that's uh, some of the work or that relates to some of the work John Sutton has done uh, with uh, uh, in his books uh, Sun Cost and Market Structure, where he pretty much looks into sun cost caused by advertising. Yeah, uh, the, the point here is what we see is that uh, the, the fewer firms we get, the higher is advertising by, by every one of that. Uh, that's what you see in, in some industries and that's what you also see in uh, or where you also see that the advertising sales ratio is high in some concentrated industry but again uh, that, that's going back to our Dorfmann Steiner uh, condition uh, here the causality doesn't go from advertising to concentration but the point is that they have rather profitable, bus uh, profitable business and so they have an incentive to 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 invest in advertisements. The very last point I want to mention is this real lemon case. I give you some further information about that uh, in, in the notes. Uh, it's, uh, the case is dis, uh, described in some more detail in Richard uh, Schmalensee's paper in, in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review from 1979. Here the real lemon case is uh, a case where you see how important trademarks might be because real lemon, case, real lemon was really the only company uh, who had a very important brand or brand name in terms of orange juice and uh, a court or, or ju judge even thought that uh, they will have to, to license uh, or they were forced to license their trademark to other producers of orange juice because no one would have bought uh, an orange juice in the US in the 19, I don't know, 70s uh, if it wouldn't have the real lemon uh, trademark on it. So here the real lemon brand, uh, uh, brand name was in a sense acting, at least in the view of the, of, of the judge, as a barrier to entry. Okay. Uh, so that's somehow how strange, but anyway, it's how it is. Okay, uh, I will tell you this next, uh, this, this empirical application by uh, Dan Ackerberg uh, next week. Briefly, I want to stop here and uh, thank you for, for joining me. And uh, as always, I'm available for some more discussion in WebEx. Have a nice week. See you next week. Bye.